We're on the road to recovery in Philadelphia with Brandon Novak. You might not know who that is by name, but you know who that is. Actor in the Jackass movies, a uh, New York Times bestselling author. What an amazing story, but a story of recovery. One that is gonna be heard and it's gonna be told. I'm so glad to share Brandon Novak's story with you. We're on the road to recovery in Philadelphia. I come from a family of extremists, man. Uh, my mother just retired after 53 years of gainful employment at Mercy Hospital History. She started out at 15 years old drawing blood for $5 a pop, recently retired second longest employer of Mercy Hospital History as a nuclear physicist on the board of Mercy Hospital. Big deal. Uh, a, a woman that, 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 that I strive to be like, man. My brother wanted to be an attorney. Uh, literally by the time he... Uh, passed his bar, went to law school, and he was blinded in student debt. Today currently resides in the White House doing pensions and benefits. See, they had the same gene that I had, but they used it in a different form and fashion. Despite any and all adverse consequences that came their way, they did what they had to do to get what they wanted to get. My father never held a job a day in his life. Smoking crack, got paranoid again. He lit the house, he went with the house, the whole thing burned down. Uh, me, on the other hand, I, 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 I was uh, awarded the ability to get my first skateboard at seven years old. And when I received that first skateboard at seven years old, my mother put me to bed that night. She said, Brandon, what do you want me to do with the skateboard? I said, I went in bed with me. She said, why? I said, because if I die, I wanted to come with me. I knew that I was going to be a professional skateboarder. Uh, I ate it. I breathed it. I slept it. I dreamt it. At the age of 16, I became it. See, much like my mother and my brother, despite any and all adverse consequences that came my way, I did what I had to do to get what I wanted to get. I became it. I was on uh, one of my first tours in the Midwest somewhere, and we were on Mike Vallely, a professional skateboarder, was on the tour with us, and he saw that I had some drugs on me. Long story short, somewhere in that tour. Mike Vallely found the drugs on me and he said, you have to get off the tour. And I was completely cool with getting kicked off the tour because like when I use, when I drink and when I drug, I don't do well with the words honest, reliable, or dependable because they don't help me get one more. I get a phone call from my team captain uh, and, and prodigy, uh, Tony Hawk, and he said, Brandon, we have one or two options we can do with you. We can put you into rehab, you can save your life, continue to be a professional skateboarder, or you can uh, quit the team. And I'd have a breath of fresh air in my lungs when I quit. I'm living at my mother's house, I'm a, I'm a full-time heroin addict. First treatment center, I'm 17 years old. I'm, I'm in this big cafeteria, it's like 10.30 at night. Now mind you, I went there to prove to my people why I'm not you uh, people in this rehab and I don't belong here. And uh, I'm ill as a research monkey, I'm making this uh, bowl of ramen flavored, ramen chicken flavored soup. I'm spilling the broth all down me. And this old black man comes to me. He says, Sit, white, white boy, what are you doing here? I said, heroin. He said, how old are you? I said, 17. He said, do yourself a favor and don't turn 18 in a place like that. As quick as he came, he left. Had no idea the significance of this conversation would ever have on me. You know what I can tell you about that black man? I can tell you where the four teeth are replaced in his mouth because at the time I had all mine. I could tell you he was black, I was white. He was 75, I was 17. He smoked crack. I successfully did heroin, my delusional mind told me. Uh, I could tell you what color his sweatpants were, what the name of his sandals were. You know what I can't tell you about that treatment center? I can't tell you my counselor's name. Skateboarding world, my hopes, my dreams, my passions, my ambitions, they're gone. I in these movies that break box office records, right? They uh, make it in these, these movies, jackass. And in these movies, man, I'm, I'm kind of, I play the character that I really am in real life. I'm that guy, Novak, who used to be the professional skateboarder from Baltimore, got strung out on heroin. I don't really give a fuck about shit. I come and go as I please. And and people in the program tell me my life is unmanageable. And, and I already suffer from this delusional mind that says that I'm an asset to everything that I do, but in reality, I'm a liability. Uh, I get asked to go to a nightclub to do an appearance. I... I, they say, what do you need? I say, I need some heroin, some Xanax, some cocaine, and some wine. They supply the items to me. I, I sign autographs. I take pictures, drink with people. And then at the night, they give me a check for five to ten thousand dollars, and I and I and I deposit it in my bank account. So I, uh, I, I, I I then go to another rehab, and I, and I come out, and I end up writing this book. This book ends up to be a New York Times bestseller, uh, autobiography, addiction memoir. I'm now getting hundreds of thousands of letters from all over the world of people saying how 
thank you. I read your book. I know my story is as bad as yours. I have 30 days clean. A uh, wife saying, thank you. I read your book. I know my husband has a disease, and that's why he picks the needle over coming to pick the kids up. My delusional mind says I just wrote the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I believe it. Uh, I once again decided to fix my alcoholism by going on a, a, a rock and roll tour, 27 countries in 29 days. I come home, all I want to do is get a shower, change my clothes, I, I go to open the door, my keys don't open the door, I kick the door and my ex fiance has picked the whole house up and moved to the city. I find myself sitting on that floor with myself, by myself, crying to myself, uh, knowing that I created this and this house now represents what I feel like a shell of a man because that's what this house was. I get a phone call from my mother. She still lives in Baltimore City. She's, it's around the time when the, uh, the police killed that young black man, Freddie Gray. And she says, Brandon, I'm scared. I say, I'm coming to take care of you because at the time, Baltimore was like the purge. They were robbing, they were looting, they were shooting, they were stealing, they were burning blocks down there, lighting police, on, play, police cars on fire. And I'm going to take care of my mother because I love her more than anything in the world. My intentions are to go take care of this woman. My actions dictate I go to her house, I go up into a bedroom, and I leave it one time a day for three months to go buy $108 worth of heroin and cocaine. And when I leave each day of the house, I gotta dodge the National Guard, I gotta dodge the machine guns, the tanks, I gotta dodge the, uh, the, the, the curfew because the police will lock me up, I gotta dodge the black kids because they're furious that white police officers killed a young black man, only to go buy a substance to then get back to my mother's house to put it in me and for it to not even work. Because I learned a long time ago that it's really hard to shoot a bag of dope when it's cut with N.A. It's really hard to drink a glass of wine when it's cut with A.A. And, and the answer to everything for 20 years has now became the problem to everything for 20 years, which is kind of okay because I shoot it up and it allows me to escape the reality I've created for myself. But what do I do when the answer, which is now the problem, doesn't even work? And I can't kill myself because I told you I want to kill myself and I want to hurt myself in the process. So I stay in this weird purgatory state where every day is going to be different only to wake up, no defense against that first one, and I'm stuck in Groundhog's Day. And uh, I, I get a phone call. Now, in theory, on paper, very successful individual. In reality, my worldly possessions consist of eight scarves, two jaggers, three socks, and a stick of deodorant, which doubles into, a, it fits into a bag that doubles as my pillow. I'm now in my mother's house, living in Baltimore City. I've given everything to drugs and alcohol, and uh, I have nowhere to go. I, I, Bam calls me, he says, we're going on tour to Australia. If you could just drink wine, you'll do great. I get to his house, he says, come upstairs, I wanna show you some footage I'm working on. I get up there, pull a cigarette out, all my heroin falls out of my pocket. And he says, you're not going on the tour, and you're not staying in my house, get the fuck out. The abnormal becoming the normal they talk about in the program. Most people will be devastated they can't go on this tour to the Gold Coast of Australia and get paid really well. It was like I had hit the mega millions because now I can go back to Baltimore and shoot dope like I like it and this tour can't stand in between me and that. And after all, it's your fucking fault because I fulfilled my part of the agreement. I showed up for the tour. I'm ready to do it. You kicked me off. My delusional mind says the tour cannot go on without me. They need me. In reality, the tour went on without me and they didn't need me. I go back to my mother's house. I knock on the door. It was a Wednesday night at 10.30. I'll never forget this as long as I live. I said, Mom, congratulations, the tour is canceled. And she looked at me, she said, no, it's not. No, it's not. They've called and told me everything. That night, 10.30, Wednesday night on her stoop, I've had much lower bottoms, but that night my bottom came up to meet me because it's fully self-induced. I created this for myself, and I can't even shoot up to fucking forget what I've created because it doesn't work. <sighs> She called my hot shot brother that day while I was in Westchester. They came to the house. They went up and they searched that room. It was like a murder scene, man. There was blood on the ceilings, blood on the walls, needles, cookers, bags. And my brother and my mother came to me that night and they said, Brandon, we refuse to continuously love you to death. With that, a police officer came around the corner. They served me a restraining order. I can't go to my family's house. My friends have left the country. I end up roaming the streets of Baltimore with myself, by myself, crying to myself. Worldly possessions, eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, and a stick of deodorant. New York Times bestseller, professional skateboarder, in these movies to break box office records. And uh, I have nowhere to go, and I end up in the same exact abandoned house I was in years ago. I believe God left that abandoned house just to prove a point to me that, like, nothing changed but the faces in that house. Once again, I'm in there shooting dope, and I get a message, social media, it's a woman uh, in Fort Lauderdale. She said, I read your book, it saved my life. I said, who gives a fuck, cool, whatever. And she said, I want you to come to Fort Lauderdale, our exclusive paid trip. 
I said, great, I need some dope, some coke, some Xanax, and some wine. She said, okay, and right there, red flag number one. My book saved her life, but she's getting me things to kill mine. That's strange. Do a little bit more of research, and I realized she's a, she lives in a hotel. So I put two and two together. She's a lady of the night or a dancer, which I'm completely cool with because I've seen me become both of those things when I need $10. I have one require. I have two requirements that I must fulfill. She wants to party and she wants to fuck. And when I shoot dope, I sleep. And I know how this is gonna play out. I'm gonna get there. I want her dime, and I'm gonna wear my welcome out really quick. And she's gonna tell me to hit the bricks. So what happens is, uh, I don't want to go because tomorrow morning I have to see my PO in Westchester at 8:30 a.m. I'm now in Baltimore City at 11 o'clock at night in a shooting gallery, and I have to see my PO and give her a urine at 8 a.m. Uh, I'm not supposed to leave Pennsylvania. I'm supposed to be at her office at 8 a.m. I'm supposed to give a clean urine. I'm in Baltimore, I'm shooting heroin, and I'm about to go to BWI to board a flight to go to Fort Lauderdale. My alcoholic mind says that I'll be able to make it back, and I believe it. So I go to the airport, the TSA airport security lady looks at me, she says, Mr. Novak, are you under the influence of anything? I said, no. She said, I believe you are. You will not fly for 72 hours. I've learned two things in my career. I cannot win an argument with TSA airport security or a judge. I believe she just doesn't want to that flight because maybe her daughter's a fan and her daughter has a problem with drugs. She's just pissing on my parade. In reality, what happened is God dressed up as a TSA airport security and did for me what I could not do for myself because uh, I didn't want to go there. I told you, my father taught me how to do jail when I go, but I don't like jail, man, because I can't shoot dope in there, so I tend to show up for my court dates. I, I get on, uh, I get on the, I call my sponsor, I said, I'm stranded at BWI Airport, and death's looking like a real good option. He said, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get on a train, you're gonna come here, we'll pick you up, and we'll take you to rehab. You know, you just listen to this story and you just shake your head. You know, here's a guy that was, his recovery, people betted against his recovery. No way was Brandon Novak ever going to recover, but he did. And he tells people if he can recover, anybody can recover. And that's the beauty of his story, his recovery journey. Uh, I walk into this treatment center and I have the clothes on my back and my worldly possessions. And my therapist looked at me and she said, Brandon, if you play your cards right, today could be the best day of your life. And I looked at her and I said, do you need a fucking your analysis? You know who I am. You know what I've done in my life this is what I've become and what happened was she saw me what I did not see in myself. I had no idea what she was talking about. They sent me up there and uh, I started doing some work on myself for once in my life. I, I started to be accountable for my actions, man. I started to be teachable because I knew that when I think I got this, I got a bag of knee, uh, a needle in my arm and a glass of wine in my hand, man. Um, what they told me to do, I did. Uh, I successfully completed that treatment center in 90 days. I went to a sober house, lived there for one year. I remember them in treatment saying, uh, you know, change your perception, change your world. Uh, what happened was I was beaten into a state of reasonableness that the big book talks about, which means is like I, I didn't know anymore and, and I knew that a power greater than myself kept me sober. I don't do this. I take no responsibility for this. What I do is I trust God, I clean house, and I help another alcoholic on a daily basis, and that's what keeps me sober. I don't keep me sober, man. I do a few things along the way to keep me grounded, but like there's a bigger than me in this picture. And uh, my mother that served that restraining order against me called me up four months ago. She said, Brandon, I get so, I hate when you come to Baltimore. I said, why? And she said, I'm, because I'm so sad when you leave. Uh, I'm gonna close with this story. There's, there's a guy that was, well, I was on parole and probation from 15 years old. I'm 36 years old now. And when I, uh, when I got out, uh, I, four months ago, I just signed my release papers. I'm no longer on parole or probation first time since I've been 15. Uh, there, there's a guy that works from home, right? And, and he's swamped in work. And his father keeps, he, he keeps banging his dad on the knee. Dad, take me out to play, take me out to play. The father's like, God, so much work to do. I'm trying to think of a way to buy time for his son so he can finish his work. And he looks on his office and his desk and his, his home and he sees a big picture of the puzzle of the world map. And the father thinks to himself, I got it. He dismantles the puzzle of the picture of the world map, throws it on the floor, says, son, when you put this puzzle back together, I'll take you out of the play. Father's surely thinking he bought eight hours, one day, two days, he's walking on the phone. 20 minutes later, the son comes back on and bangs him in the knee. He said, Dad, I put the puzzle back together. The father's like, no fucking way. He walks in, sure enough, the picture of the puzzle of the world map is put back together. Father says to his son, how did you do this so fast? He said, it was simple, Dad. On the back of the picture of the puzzle of the world map was a picture of the man. I put the man back together and the world fell back into place. 
Together we stand, divided I die. Today I currently am employed by Banyan Treatment Center. I help people that want to be helped on a daily basis. Uh, my number will be on the screen. If you're suffering from addiction and you want a way out, please feel free to call me. Uh, and, and if you uh, want to explore more options, a man in recovery. And it's a non-for-profit organization that helps people get into treatment with no insurance, man. You call, we'll answer. Cheers. What a journey, what a story, what an amazing ending to the dream seller, Brandon Novak. Uh, I'm so glad I was able to share his story with you. Please share his story with other people. He's an inspiration and he's selflessly helping so many people all across our country. We'll see you on the next episode of On the Road to Recovery.